Welcome to session five of the Bowsworth 50th Anniversary Festival. This session is the launch of a book written by authors with careers in social work spanning 50 years. Social Work Past, Present and Future is a collection from Policy Press edited by Terry Bamford and Keith Bilton. The book was not written with or for Bowsworth and should not be taken as representing Bowsworth's views. The authors offer their independent lens on 50 years of social work and add to our discussion about where we've come from and where we're going as a profession. Co-editor Keith Bilton was unfortunately unable to join the panel, but his contributions are described by the chair. The other co-editor, Terry Bamford, tragically died from an accident in February 2020 before the book's publication. He was a much loved and respected social worker and social services director, active in Basra and in the International Federation of Social Workers. Sharing his book is in part in his honour. The book was inspired by the work and seminars of the Social Work History Network, which the co-editors helped to found and run. The network is hosted by King's College London and information is on their website. The session is chaired by John Dudley, Baswell's honorary treasurer, and the authors presenting their chapters are Emeritus Professor June Thoburn of the University of East Anglia, Professor Peter Beresford, University of Essex, Susie Croft, palliative care social worker of 28 years and author, Emeritus Professor Jane Tunstall, Royal Holloway College, University of London. Malcolm Jordan, academic and member of the Social Workers Union Executive. Guy Shannon, ex Basel Chair and founder of the Solution Focus Collective. Emma Gant, social worker in practice in a local authority children and families team. David Jones, Chair of Basel's International Committee and past President of the International Federation of Social Workers. And Emeritus Professor Hilary Thompson of Kingston University and St George's London and on Basel Council. Terry Bamford's wife Margaret is also a highly respected social worker and she helped him with the book. She has kindly provided a short film as introduction to this session. Good afternoon. Terry would so love to have been here today for this celebration. He had a lifelong commitment to Basel, 50 years, and of course to social work. He was passionate about social work practice. He wrote prolifically and elegantly over all that time. And those of you who have read his work will know just how good that those works are. This, he always said, was the hardest thing he's ever done. He said that the social work network, of which he was incredibly proud, was also something which brought great credit on the profession. He wanted to capture all the papers that had been contributed over the last four to five years, some of which he said were outstanding. This book is representative of, represents all, or at least a selection of some of those contributions. The authors read like a who's who of social work. He was so proud of his association with the grandees of social work. But coming to edit, chapters is not easy. These gems, these wonderful pieces of work, were written in different styles. He had to try and accommodate those styles. He spent many hours with Keith trying to think how best this could be done. And how do you approach an academic or a respected professional and ask them if they would mind adjusting certain things? Styles of referencing were also very different. So he had to make sure there was a standard form of referencing. Instead of asking the contributors if they would rearrange their references in a certain order, he went to the British Library himself. You all know that Terry wasn't a detailed man. He was a broad brush man. And yet every day he was at the British Library checking every single reference from this book to make sure of its accuracy. I thought he was taking up permanent residence there. When he sent the final version that he and Keith had agreed to Policy Press, he was worried because he felt that Policy Press would come back, they'd find something that was wrong with it, and we were due to go to Marrakesh. But just before we left, he heard that it had been accepted without any adjustments, and the deadline for the 50th anniversary launch had been met. Uh, 
I'd love to talk about Terry's life and what he contributed to social work, uh, but I think most of you know that. I just want to talk about how good he was at recording, noting and writing about policy and strategic developments. He had such a great knack for writing clearly and succinctly. His last book was to have been about uh, housing and social work. As you know, he was Executive Director of Housing and Social Services in Kensington and Chelsea and was responsible for setting up the tenant management organisation, obviously along with others, but felt very, very strongly that this was the way to go for social housing. He was absolutely gutted when he got, came downstairs one morning to see Grenfell on fire. And he wanted to write about social work and uh, housing policy over the last 50 years to try and bring some light to bear on how and why this had happened. The considerable work he's already done on that is available for anybody who wanted it, but the request from Policy Press about this book, about history, past, uh, social work, present, past and future, had to take priority. So anybody who wants the material from Grenfell is very welcome to have it. Terry often used to invite me to read things he was unsure about, and I read everything as it was produced. Um, <coughs> I've read every chapter, I've reread every chapter because I had them all on my laptop. And once again, I have to commend the book to you for all the wonderful contributors, the wonderful editing and referencing. And I just think it's a, an excellent book and I would commend it to you. Terry has, sadly, no veto on what I've been able to say today. He always accused me of hyperbole. And, I was, and I've just been so looking forward to the opportunity to so embarrass him. I leave you to be the judge of whether or not you've been embarrassed or whether you think I've only spoken about Terry as he was. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk this afternoon and buy the book, buy it for your friends and enjoy it. So the book itself consists of uh, 12 chapters and I'm going to ask each of the contributors to uh, distill the essence of their chapters. And as we go along, I'll also mention the other contributors uh, who are unable to be here and uh, the areas they cover. So uh, Keith Bilton, of course, is one of those. And uh, uh, Keith uh, has a, a very long association uh, with social work, obviously, and also uh, was one of the founding members of the British Association of Social Workers. So he's lived very much lived through uh, the, the 50 years that the, uh, the book covers. And uh, in the chapter one, uh, he looks some, at something of the uh, situation in 1970 when uh, uh, there was a significant uh, legislation um, around the implementation of the Seaburn report, uh, around uh, the implementation of local authority social services departments, and indeed uh, he was involved in the discussions around the establishment of BASWA itself. And it's uh, uh, perhaps a salutary reminder of the long and tortuous negotiations that were eventually to make 1970 in many ways a landmark year in the development of social work. Uh, chapter two uh, by uh, Terry Bamford looks at social services department and poses the question, the intricate difficult question, were they a success or a failure? And uh, certainly they put social services at the top of the local government agenda. Uh, but uh, perhaps never quite achieved the great things that were hoped for them because, of course, pretty much as soon as they were developed, uh, local government started to suffer the first in a series of, of cutbacks and restrictions on budgetary. Uh, and uh, the, the 1975 financial crisis uh, put the brakes on some of the developments that had been hoped for, just as the 2008 financial crisis did in uh, terms of heralding in the uh, current years of austerity. So um, uh, that's uh, an interesting uh, uh, part of the uh, history to, to look at. 
So chapter three uh, is uh, by David Jones. I'll, I'll hand over to him to say a little bit more about that. Thanks, John. I, one of the frustrations, I think, for all of us as authors was the fact we had only 6,000 words, including references. So, in fact, it was less than 5,000 words um, to cover 50 years of background. And one of my challenges in looking at inspection of agencies and regulation of social work were the vast number of changes, the organisational instability, especially over the last 20 years, just describing the structure and what had happened and how the different agencies had related to each other and why government abolished one and created another um, took up a lot of time. So I suppose when I look back on it, I'm frustrated that I didn't talk a bit more from my own experience, having been an inspector for part of my career, um, as to what makes for good inspection. And I don't think I've drawn that out well enough. What are the behaviours, what are the, the, the focus that makes for good inspection? Um, but also the chapter focuses on the regulation of social workers, and that's a campaign Basware was involved in and the predecessor organisations have been involved in. Um, and of course, we saw the creation of the General Social Care Council. June was involved with that, as was Terry. Um, and then we moved now through the different regulators in the different four countries, and we have Social Work England. And I suppose I end with a, a sadness that the uh, government created Social Work England and there was a big political battle about its structure. But it feels to me it really is going to be an insult that there have been no qualified social workers, no current registrants are actually members of the governing board. And I don't think any other profession would accept this. And when you look back, the reason we have regulation, there are many reasons, but one of the main reasons is that Basra campaigned for it because social workers believed it was important and wanted our profession to be regulated in the public interest, involving service users and, and others, and not even arguing that Basra, the social workers, should be the majority, but that there should be some registrants on, the, on Social Work England. And my book um, chapter um, at the end there poses that, that question as to why it is that that hasn't happened and how sad it is that the regulator of social workers does not have a single person on the board who is representing the voice of practitioners and academics and others. And I think that has got to be rectified. Great, thanks very much, David. And uh, moving on to chapter four, continuity of change in the knowledge base for social work. And uh, uh, for that, back to you, June. You will need to unmute yourself. Me. <laughs> My chapter is about the knowledge base for social work. Um, and like David, the frustration, as you can imagine, 50 years of our knowledge base, and you can imagine what the original bibliography looked like and how many people I had reluctantly to sacrifice in order to meet the deadline, but, uh, or the word, word length. Um, but I have three questions. First of all, where does our knowledge come from? Which countries? Early on, uh, there was some homegrown, but most of the influence came from the USA. You think of Perlman, Beestick come to mind. But more recently, more of it's come from Europe, helped very much by the Erasmus programme, and people will be interested in Karen Lyon's uh, chapter about that. Second, which academic discipline predominated? Early on, social policy and politics. Clement Attlee and Richard Titmus were training social workers at the LSE way before the, our, our time frame comes in. But also psychology and psychiatry. I'll mention just Winnicott, but also R.D. Lang and the anti-psychiatry anti movement, uh, and, and sociology and the, the huge tome of Peter Townsend's The Last Refuge. Uh, so, so still so highly relevant. Uh, but then from the 1970s onwards, we had the rapid development of social work as an academic discipline. And the UK led the, led the way here and still are way ahead of many European countries uh, in, in recognising, for instance, PhDs in social work. 
um, uh, and social workers became uh, uni university research educators. Um, and they brought in discussions about practice approaches, specific methods became central to the curriculum. Uh, around this time, Olive Stevenson was the first editor of BJSW, all credit to Baz's work there. Uh, and Bob Holman and Noel Timms incorporated the voices of the clients into research and into the knowledge base. Thirdly, where does the knowledge, where, where is the knowledge generated? Early on, uh, most social work research was in universities. It was funded by the government, by the charity, big charities like Nuffield, and by the high, high, higher education, but it was independent of them. Uh, I'll just mention the 11 messages from research overviews, which are examples of this period. More recently, much research relevant to social work is commissioned from non-social workers in general research centres, including private for profit organisations such as the big consultancy firms. So where are we now? The government has used, I would argue, and do argue in the, in the chapter, its financial power, e.g. through the What Works Centre and on-the-job training outside universities to exercise much greater control over the knowledge base for practice and therefore on the nature of social work itself. But as a counterbalance, social media platforms have opened the way for experts by experience to have their say on what social workers need to know. So that's my quick resume, <laughs> 50 years of knowledge. Thanks very much June and, and bringing us right up to date there with the uh, social media references at the end as times have changed so fast. So now we move on to chapter five, uh, social work education, learning from the past and uh, raising that question for us, Hilary Tomsit. So over to you, Hilary. Thank, Thank you very much, John. Hello. I felt really privileged when De Terry Banford and Keith Bilton asked me to write the chapter on social work education, looking back over 50 years. So thank you to them for trusting me. As I began in social work in 1973 and qualified in 76, it was like tracking my whole career. And I did find it a daunting challenge to condense so much change into a short chapter. Terry's introduction highlights two key developments in education over this period. The separation of probation and the drive to a unified qualification with the DIPSWA. In my chapter, I also looked at seven questions that appear to have shaped educational approaches and decisions. How is the nature of the profession and the discipline of social work perceived? Are we preparing social workers for one professional role or many? And who will make good social workers? Then also, how many social work recruits do we need? Who's best to make decisions about social work education? and what's important in social work course content. And finally, who should pay and what does it cost? Clearly, all these same questions are being asked now and whether employers, governments and education providers agree on what makes a good social worker and what kind of education prepares them best for being a professional. We want excellent relationship-based practice informed by critical reflection, evidence and research, not just specialist knowledge for a narrow job role. Key, key challenges for the future are that we still have a way to go with social work's public image and its place in society and have per perhaps focused too much on tinkering with shorter work-based educational routes for faster recruitment rather than on retention and looking after the social workers that we have and their professional development and career frameworks. Change, poverty and inequality will always be our work context, creating pressure, challenge and uncertainty but I think the social work profession and social work education have always been dynamic and evolving, adapting to new circumstances and needs. My chapter is subtitled Learning from the Past with a question mark, as John pointed out, and I hope this book will help with this. But we do have strengths that we, we can draw on for the future, and I highlight three of these. Firstly, our fundamental and shared social work values that underpin our educational approaches and support a robust principled research base. Secondly, our collaboration with others to, to keep academic and practice learning relevant to current contexts, whatever they are. That includes universities, employers, regulators, governments, 
and people who experience services all working together. And thirdly, being part of a, collect of a global profession in an international context and a strong collective across the UK with BASWA as the lead social work professional association in a much stronger position now to support and unite our individual and joint contributions. So thanks to all who made this book happen, the Social Work History Network, BASWA, the colleagues I've worked with in the writing of the book, and particularly Keith and Terry, whose commitment drive and supportive tactful editorship has I think made this a highly significant book. It commemorates both a moment in historic reflection and the inspiration of Terry, a lateral thinker, a warm collaborator, and a person always epitomizing the integrity and values of a true social worker and a gentleman. I hope you enjoy reading this book too. So thank you and happy birthday, Baswa. Now back to John. Thanks very much, Hilary. And now to add his reflections uh, on uh, chapter six, uh, practicing social work, it's over to Guy Shannon. Thanks, Guy. Okay, thank you, John. And um, just like Hilary, I wanted to start by saying I, I was deeply honoured when um, Terry, Terry Bamford, contacted me to invite me to contribute a chapter to this book. Um, honoured and a little bit daunted, really, um, to be in a book surrounded by the people I see surrounding me on this computer screen at the moment. And uh, so that was a great honour. And um, I also really appreciate uh, the support of um, Keith in the editing of the book. Um, just to add, Terry was a great friend and support to me while I was chair of Baswa, and I miss him hugely. Um, so the brief I was given was to write a chapter on social work practice and changes in social work practice over the past 50 years. Um, 50 years ago, I was about eight or nine years old. So um, that was, uh, I had to do a little bit of research. Um, but as I started thinking about changes in social work practice, interestingly, uh, this simultaneously raised the question about what, did, what if anything had stayed the same? Um, and that got me thinking about the essence of social work really. So uh, a similar challenge to trying to, sum, to um, provide the essence of the chapter in this couple of minutes now. Um, I believe that there has been fundamental change in social work in the past 50 years, and that something has remained that I'll come back to later, but it's similar to what people have said already. Just to acknowledge, um, I'm going to just refer to my own personal experience a touch here, which was mainly working with children once I qualified as a social worker, but I think the situation is quite analogous in adult services. Um, I qualified in 1989, um, and I think we were confident, myself and my colleagues at the time, that we knew what social work was. We knew that it involved, or what it was meant to be, perhaps that it involved care as well as control to use some of the language back then. It was about helping people, perhaps to use some of the language from slightly further back than them. Um, and that in children's services, which I was soon to enter, I started as a generic social worker uh, in principle, but as a children's social worker really in practice. And we knew that the job involved supporting families as well as protecting children. And these are the same thing, actually, really. And the Children Act very much reinforced this, that our responsibilities involve family support as well as child protection. We came to realise, we came to know that we weren't really doing that. And I wrote a paper, I was working as a social worker in a, a duty team, a children's uh, reception team, it was called, in. Uh, in Derby in the mid 1990s. And I wrote a paper, a little bit frustrated um, at um, yeah, how the work was. And I was making a suggestion about how we could um, respond to requests for help by families. And in that paper, I said, although we're called the children's reception team, really it feels like we are a child protection investigation team. And this wasn't the whole of social work. Um, so the 25 years later, I do have the same concerns really. And um, thinking about this very moment and reading reports about social work during COVID. And I've read reports about concerns that because of the COVID restrictions, social workers aren't able to go out and visit to check up on children. And I found myself wishing that I was reading reports saying that social workers cannot go out to visit to support families. And, <clears throat> I think this is a structural issue, so it's not about individual social workers. 
Um, but I think we all have a collective responsibility as social workers um, to be um, supporting and helping, providing care. Uh, I think individuals go into social work to help people. I'm currently reading a book by Jane Fenton. I could say with this, maybe after this book, the second best book in the past couple of years, um, Social Work for Lazy Radicals. And fascinating book. She, she cites Zygmunt Bowman. I've never heard his name said out loud, so I hope that's pronounced correctly. Um, and, she, and he wrote an article, I think, in the European Journal of Social Work, another importance of European uh, social work, um, which Jane draws from. And he talks about the original ethical impulse and how in neoliberal times, neoliberal social work, social work has been distanced from its original ethical impulse. Well, I think that's not changed. I think the impulse has not changed. And it connects with what a couple of people have said about the values. And I think Basra is part of an embodiment of the values. So in essence, I would see my chapter really as a plea or encouragement to social workers and to all stakeholders in social work to do what we can to reunite social work with its original ethical impulse. And I know that Basra can and will uh, play its part in that and the social work history network too people that carry this flame for the original ethical impulse of social work so thank you everyone thank you john thanks very much guy thanks for that rallying call at the end there which i'm sure we'll want to uh, to pick we might want to pick up later so uh, chapter seven uh, brings us on to looking back and looking forward so two very personal views and for that i'm happy to hand over to uh, Malcolm Jordan and Emma. Having uh, welcomed the, the invitation to join in this great book, um, my chapter came down to professionalism and manager, managerialism, uh, a subject which would take a book in itself. So I decided to do it by looking at my career since the mid-50s and 60s. Uh, and seeing how the balance between those two things have changed. Um, in the, uh, those early days, of course, the profession was dispersed among a great deal of settings. Uh, and if, for example, you worked in a hospital, you were seen as a self-managing professional. If, however, you were in a local authority welfare department, probably under the thumb of the medical officer of health, uh, then you were seen as an administrator. So we've moved on from those days. And the um, biggest change, I suppose, was 1968, implementing the Seabone report. And um, that brought us all together in one department, thankfully, where we could unify and uh, have a bit more weight in what happened. Um, and I think that was probably a very good thing. I, I very much regret that it's been split up since. Um, but at that time, of course, well, not everybody thought it was a good idea, particularly the radical magazine Case Con that saw seabone factories with downtrodden workers. And um, at that time, the term manager was hardly ever used. We were team leaders. We had team leaders to lead us. Since then, the years have got rolled by with numerous attempts by both the profession and the government to identify uh, what the profession is and identify it, but also from government to try and identify its tasks so that we can be measured more precisely uh, to fit into their code. And that, of course, leads into managerialism, which is entirely committed to measurement uh, and value, as they see the value. Um, in two, 2005, the General Social Care Council was set up and we got protection of title as social workers, which was another strong point along the way, I think. Today, I work with social workers and students and I'm overwhelmed by their commitment and enthusiasm to abide by our professional values in the situations, quite oppressive situations, in which they work and in which they find their service users. With a hundred mile boot out austerity uh, march three years ago, and the establishment of the 
austerity action group uh, with SWU and Basra, I think we've moved on. And we've now got, and the, the, the publication of uh, pover poverty handbooks and various tools for helping social workers stand up in their organizations. So I think um, the future looks good for the profession led by Basra. I think that's very good. Um, we seem to be a more actively politically engaged uh, profession. It's a bit like the 60s and 70s, really, I think. And uh, now over to Emma. Hi. Um, yes, this is a very exciting for me to be here. Um, I'm extremely grateful for this opportunity. Um, I think the, the reason I'm here is that um, I sent a poem into the um, Professional Social Work magazine about my experience, which wasn't very good, of being um, in my assessed and supported year in employment after qualifying, doing my degree. I did the traditional route through a three-year degree. Um, and I think Shahid Navi um, passed my contact details on to Terry and I got this, uh, we had a lovely conversation um, about various things including, you know, um, this idea of this book which just for me was just an amazing opportunity. Um, I'm really sorry I never got to meet Terry um, and I haven't met Keith either so, you know, um, but still, and sad that we can't be together, which um, hopefully we would have been if it hadn't been for COVID-19. Um, yeah, so it was very tough as a lot of people, a lot of the others of you've already said, to, to, to stick to the remit, particularly for me, sort of never having written anything for a book before. Um, so yeah, very, very tough to stick to the remit and very, and being edited, was, a, was a, a new experience and one that was quite interesting um, and but Terry and Keith were very gentle with me I think um, and gentle with their guidance um, you know keeping me to my word counts and often pointing out that I was going off on a tour anti-Tory rant and bringing me back to what I should be writing about um, it felt quite scary but it felt quite necessary just like my choice to become a social worker feels like a very brave thing to do. And I think looking at the book as a whole now, um, what, what highlighted for me was actually how relatively young our profession is, although you wouldn't know that by looking at the age of all us authors, <laughs> um, and just how many changes um, it's been through. And people don't like changes, do they? And as social workers, um, that's what we're, we're charged with doing. Um, but change can only happen with honesty. And honesty means everyone must be able to speak the truth of what is actually happening with impunity. In my experience, we expect the families we work with to tell us the truth. But how often are we really truthful about what is going on for us in our jobs? I'm speaking as a children's social worker here. Um, this is very personal experience for me but certainly in my experience how often are we able to raise questions about the way the system is potentially doing harm to a family whilst fulfilling the statutory role of protecting children how stressed and burnt out are you actually feeling right now and how is that going to influence your the quality of your practice Workers are put in impossible positions, working their hearts out to meet impossible statutory targets. They're pushed further and further by managers, locked in a battle to produce good figures. An acknowledgement of these terrible working conditions, a commitment to address them and compassion, both for the workers and for the families, can go a long way to reducing the toxicity of such environments. Not those. Um, as a caring profession, we should be rewarding those who reject such environments um, rather than 
rewarding those who thrive in them. But such attitudes trickle down. And when we are led by donkeys, we need to assert ourselves as lions who will not follow, but who will challenge. Thanks very much, Emma, for your personal reflections. And uh, uh, yes, a good message for us all to have the possibility of rising up like lions. Uh, again, that's uh, very, very uh, important. So moving on then to uh, chapter eight, and uh, I've been very uh, privileged over the last few days to be marking a, a large number of uh, social work student essays about improving relationships between social workers and service users. And uh, actually the most quoted uh, authors uh, amongst those were in fact Beresford and Croft. So I'm more than delighted uh, to be able to welcome Peter Beresford and Susie Croft uh, to talk about their chapter eight from clients to fellow citizens to service users as co-producers of social work. So over to you, Peter and Susie. Hi, I'm Susie, obviously, um, and it's really great to be here celebrating um, the 50th anniversary of Baswa. So we were really thrilled to contribute to this book um, for this anniversary as a practitioner and a service user. Um, as John said, I've worked for 28 years. Um, I think he added two on and gave me 30, but it's actually 28 years as a face-to-face -face palliative care practitioner, social worker. Um, I worked in palliative care and for many of those years, I was privileged to work as a social worker in the hospice for central London. The key point I want to make, um, and I do think that it connects up with a lot of uh, the lot that others have said, such as David, Emma, and so on, is that social workers, social work must listen to frontline practitioners. I think so often we, the frontline practitioners, are not part of the conversation. We don't have a seat at important tables. We're not represented. But it's actually essential that our practice of wisdom is listened to. I think it's essential our voice is heard. And it's actually essential that social workers, the frontline practitioners who are doing the job, actually have a say in what social work is meant to be about and what social work is doing. And I think so often that absolutely isn't the case. Hi, it's, it's Peter here. And as you'll have realised, our, our chapter was really about ensuring the inclusion and the, the prioritisation of the perspectives and the voices of practitioners and, of course, service users and carers. And, and what I think I'm especially proud of is the leading role that social work has played for years uh, in, in making sure that the voices of service users and carers in diversity uh, are part of, of the development of social work and how it's learnt and practiced. But we, we have to be honest with ourselves that social work now in these terrible times is very vulnerable. Children and families social work is being residualized, controlled uh, and financially starved. And adult social work, social work with adults, in my view, is disappearing and it's being made into a rationing rather than supporting service that's what so many service users say what what, what we've argued for in our in our chapter is a um, a universal approach to social work social work for all uh, it, social work should not be a service seen as only needed by people identified as residual or marginal or poor it's so helpful as i know susie uh, felt from working with a very wide range of people in palliative care for so many but I do feel there is real hope even in these terrible times and I would want us to look at the, the current experience of probation. Probation which government sought to destroy by its extreme privatisation policies from Mrs Thatcher onwards. It's disastrous privatisation uh, experiment and now this government has had to run back from that privatisation and it is now we know reinstating probation as a public service. I've learned lots from the, the, the key voices in probation, some of which are no longer with us, sadly. And I think there's a lot of encouragement for us to gain and to see their struggle as one uh, that we really should be taking up with all force. And we must hope our leaders do. So, and I'm sure that service users and carers will value the profession for doing that. 
So thanks a lot, and it's a great book to be part of. Thanks very much to Susie and Peter. Now, uh, we're moving on to uh, chapter nine, and uh, around about 1990, I think, I went to a seminar addressed by uh, Lady Justice Butler Sloss, who described the Children Act uh, 1989 in the immortal and well-loved phrase, the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, she did literally use that phrase. Um, and uh, the question that uh, is posed in chapter nine, the 1989 Children and Wales Children Act, the high watermark of progressive reform, question mark. And to help us uh, address that question, I'm going to pass over to Jane Tunstall. So thanks, Jane. Um, yes, well, the short answer is yes, it was the high watermark. And that our, our chapter, our being June Thoburn and me, our joint chapter should probably come with a, a sort of a, a depression warning because I don't think reading about what indeed Butler Sloss would have alluded to with the expectations and the, the very positive aspirations of the act have necessarily been borne out um, in the 50 years that we've, we've reflected on. We've taken the opportunity to reflect on the last 50 years through the lens of, of the act, which is about as opposite to a, um, a sort of rose tinted glass as you could get. Um, but I'd like to say, I'd like to sort of underline, and I'm sure June would agree with me, how important it was for all of us that the, that the act was unusual in many ways, but, but, but in particular unusual in the sense of being evidence informed and genuinely drawing on a model of consultation and partnership and, and wanting to hear from people. And I don't want to overly personalise this, but I, if I think of one seminal event um, in Alexander Fleming House, which was when the Department of Health was based, with the wonderful Mr Children Act um, um, civil servant, Rupert Hughes, um, carrying out a consultation, where June was arguing passionately, I can't even remember what she was arguing, almost certainly something about looked after children, when her chair exploded beneath her, literally, and one moment she was sort of sitting at the table, and the next moment her chin was lodged on the edge of the table, but Rupert took it in his stride, and June, as she will not be surprised to know, carried on. So there's a serious point there that both evidence informed in the way that it was drafted, but crucially, of course, evidence informed in terms of the very big research and evaluation programmes that have been carried out since um, to look at the working of the Children Act with a range of, 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 of practitioner research and, and academic research. And, 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 and in itself, um, the extent to which those messages have been heard, probably a clue as to why I think we can, um, we can look back on, on the act as marking some sort of high watermark, um, whether it was progressive thought or not. I'd want to say, uh, and people have made the point um, earlier on, that social work with children and families in particular finds itself colliding with political, social and moral values partly because of the close association between poor families wanting and needing to use services, obviously partly to do with, with constructs of the family. But children and family social workers, I guess it's a, a partisan view, in my, but in my own view, are particularly vulnerable to political um, edict. Whether, whether you look at the 1834 poor law, which was child and family social work, or you look at the spectacle of, of, the, uh, of the Tory party voting en masse two weeks ago to deregulate safeguards for children, they came back with the exemption clauses, which Baswa had been very robustly involved in fighting two years ago, and Ruth will remember, um, as indeed it was in, in campaigning for many of the clauses of the Act. So I'd like us to remember that Baswa has always been a campaigning organisation. Sometimes we've had successes, sometimes not. And the Children Act it could be analysed very easily as a thread to look at, at the appropriate relationship between good social work practice and the role of social workers as reformers and campaigners. I'd like us not to lose that. Um, just to say that the act in itself was hugely imaginative. Um, and sought to make a real difference to a very robust, multifaceted notion of, of the well-being of children. Um, it, it introduced the, 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 the paramount, the paramountcy of the interest of the child, the very clear message that the primary responsibility of, of bringing children up should be with their parents who deserve to be helped in that process and that services should work in partnership with parents. 
we in our chapter did a sort of audit of those three aspects and we looked at family centres, uh, working in partnership and 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 looked after children and I can't um, I can't um, uh, uh, but conclude that 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 things haven't been great it's not um, um, a, a, not a, a rosy picture at all all sorts of things have impacted whether it's been the mixed economy the privatization of services the massive increase in child poverty, the destruction of access to housing, you name it, it's impacted on the, the lived experience of, the, of, the, of, the, of the, the families and the children and young people who use social work services. And over my career, I've been privileged to have a close relationship with ATD Fourth World, and maybe a future, um, a future Basra event might, might bring us together so that those families can talk very well about what the model of good social work is that they, that they appreciate, but also the impact of poverty on their lives. So without um, pr producing any rabbits um, out of the hat, um, it's gloomy, the conclusion that we reach. Um, crucially, I think, because of the failure to implement part three of the act, terribly undermined the integrity of all the others, because in the sense of, of not taking seriously the duty to promote and safeguard the children and the families in the community, before you move on to look at other more robust intervention strategies, whether, as was the Tories, we now have compulsory adoption or just merely um, a, a, a respite care in other ways. If you don't provide all of those services in the round, you get a very skewed residual and as a Peter and, and Susie have alluded to, potentially very oppressive system. But there are, I'm going to be partisan about this, I think it's our duty as, as, as individual social workers, teachers, to look where we can and celebrate where people are doing their best. And there are local authorities where people are seizing these challenges. I don't want to look like I've been bribed by people in Leeds, but it's very inspiring to look at some of the work that they're doing in Leeds against the, 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 the backdrop of all of the, the, the legal and political constraints that I've indicated. It can be done, and, and Baswar, I think, can work in partnership with agencies to show that it can be done and to support them when they fall foul of ideas on the part of politicians. I'll try and be um, even handed here on both sides of the divide who may be constructing a system that we don't think is in the best interests of children and families. So that's my message and I, and I hope June's still speaking to me afterwards. Joan is, June is notoriously more optimistic than me. So between the two of us probably lies how the world is. Thank you very much Jane and certainly uh, you finished with a note of optimism things can be done differently and better. Uh, amid some of the uh, amid some of the gloom so thanks very much for that well uh, chapter 10 of the book is by another chapter by terry bamford and in fact uh, looks at issues around offending uh, and it, it refers actually to some of the issues that uh, peter mentioned a little earlier about the uh, role of the probation service um, and argues that if uh, reoffending is to be addressed effectively the remodeled service will need to look at the social factors uh, including housing, employment, income, and their impact on the offender. So uh, important stuff there. Uh, chapter 11, uh, Ray Jones, who uh, is uh, another uh, long-standing supporter of Baswa and is also Emeritus Professor of Social Work at Kingston uh, University in St George's, the University of London. Uh, he moves on to look at the impact that uh, some of the big um, reports and reviews have had on uh, social work and uh, in fact challenges the widely held view that scandals, some of these scandals and some of the reports that uh, derive from them actually drive a policy change. Um, so uh, it's, it's uh, interesting stuff to, uh, to have a look at his reflections on there. And then finally chapter 12 uh, Karen Lyons looks at the very important and increasing emphasis on international work uh, with the wider use of the international definition of social work. And she raises the question of the relatively narrow construction of social work in the UK as primarily a local authority role, uh, a theme which uh, echoes many of the other contributors 
Um, so that gives you some notion of the, uh, the spread of the book and the, the range of the subjects that uh, are covered. And thank you very much for the contributors, present and not present, for uh, telling us a little bit about it. Well, I'd like to give a really big thank you to all of the panellists who've contributed their thoughts and feelings to today's event. So a very big thank you to all of them. Uh, the, their book, Social Work, Past, Present and Future, published by Policy Press, is out now from all the usual outlets. Uh, and finally, a big thank you to all of you for uh, tuning in. And I hope you've uh, found this of interest and that you enjoy the other events in the Basra Heritage Festival. Thanks very much and goodbye. <laughs>